I kind of copped on fairly young that I was like, oh, there's ways of still performing to a high level if you're not the kind of most flashiest of players. There's mm-hmm. ways of kind of developing a competitive instinct, developing a kind of mental toughness, I think. I was 15 and I was playing with guys who were about 17, 18. And I was like, okay, how am I going to compete with these guys? Because A, they're ooh, like, they're grown men at that point and I'm <laughs> a hormonal teenager. But I, it was like, okay, I can control certain things and I can ensure that maybe, I, if, if not in reality, but in my own brain, if nowhere else, I'm working hard or I'm working to my capacity where possible. Mm-hmm. That's something that definitely, I think, translates into the world of acting. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Paul Meskel is an actor. He sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. You have a really good football analogy to acting preparation that you said in another interview. But I have to say, first off, I'm an American, okay? So when you say the word football, obviously I think of American football. Next thing I think is what we call soccer here. (laughs) But that is not what we're talking about here, are we? Keep going, keep going. (laughs) We're talking, I don't understand how all these sports are called football. At home, like in Ireland, I would call it football, football. But like talking to anybody who isn't from Ireland, I would say Gaelic football. It's an incredibly difficult sport to describe other than it's kind of this mad cross between soccer and rugby and a bit of like American football or, and, and throwing a bit of like Irish madness into the equation as well. Okay, so here's, a, here's your quote about football in relation to acting. I enjoy when you feel like you're working really hard because it eliminates doubt when you get to the point of performance on the stage or field. That's the only time I can feel free in anything, when I feel like I've prepared effectively. I think the fact that I wasn't the most skillful footballer has informed the way I prepare as an actor. And I I really think that if you could just talk about this a little bit, because I love, first of all, I love sports analogies. Yeah. (laughs) It really gets the point across here because... The idea that you you were finding out something about when you were playing football about the work that needs to be put in before the field, yeah, and how you relate that to the work that needs to be put in before you hit the stage. I suppose, like, if I was to crystallize that thought process, it comes. I had a very important manager in my life, a man called Brian Murphy, who was kind of the first manager I had when I was playing kind of at a higher level, so intercounty football. Gaelic football and he said his one advice a piece of advice that has stuck with with me kind of to this day is he said this thing in preparation the only thing you can control are the controllables so like in a sporting context that is ensuring that your preparation in the weeks months days of a big match or, or 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 in the context of being on stage or in front of screen the weeks months days in the in the lead up to that you control the controllable. So in a sporting context, that is ensuring that you're training really hard, ensuring that you're getting the right amount of sleep, ensuring that you're eating well, ensuring that you're, if you feel like you can do a bit of extra preparation, if you can do, go out for a couple of 5Ks, there are things that are within your control. And the closer you get to a match, it's about upping your hydration intake, ensuring that you're getting the right amount of carbs in in the lead up to it. And then, and by controlling those things, you are focusing your brain on, you're, you're kind of changing the way that your brain is programmed. You're not then thinking of like, oh, what happens if I have, what happens if the guy that I'm marking or the guy that I'm up against has the best performance of his life or, or mm-hmm. what happens if I pull my hamstring or what happens if I don't play well or what happens if it rains or all of these things. They're things that are totally out of your control. Right, and right. that I find that quite liberating. And, and, and in terms of, I, I wasn't like particularly skillful, but I, I was, I kind of copped on fairly young that I was like, oh, there's ways of still performing to a high level if you're not the kind of most flashiest of players. 
mm-hmm. there's ways of kind of developing a competitive instinct developing a kind of higher work rate or develop developing a kind of mental toughness i think which i have def- and, and that i remember i remember hearing that thing from brian i was about 16 and i was playing with guys who were about eight, uh I was 15 and I was playing with guys who were about 17, 18. And I was like, okay, how am I going to compete with these guys? Because A, they're ooh, like, they're grown men at that point And I'm <laughs> a hormonal teenager, but I, it was like, okay, I can control certain things and I can ensure that maybe I, if, if not in reality, but in my own brain, if nowhere else, I'm working harder or I'm working to my capacity where possible. Mm-hmm. And that's something that definitely I think translates into the world of acting. And as you, yeah, so as you were saying that, I was thinking, what you know, you cannot control what if the other person's forgets their lines. If you're on the stage, if the other per, you know, if if you forget your lines, you can't control how you're going. If something happens on your on the way to the stage, uh, you know that you know yeah. you can't control any all these things. Or even on the set, you know, like you get to the set and wow, wow all my preparation is gone because I really pictured this whole space differently. If you put the work in, like you're saying to other things that that just develop your your mind and your in your body really that that it it helps you to then be at your best in that moment to adapt right that's what really what you're saying totally so when i heard that you never stepped on a set before normal people you know i was thinking like how could he have done this kind of work <laughs> How could he have done this kind of, and that, that's what I really want to find out in this time with us. Mm-hmm. But before we even get there, you had a bunch of chemistry reads before you knew you had the part, and yeah. then a bunch of chemistry reads after you knew you had the part, and at the end of those was Daisy. Mm-hmm. And I want to just talk a little bit about this, because this is an interesting thing that we haven't examined on the show yet. The whole idea of auditioning when you know you don't have the part or trying to connect with somebody when you know you don't have the part as opposed to when you have the part and you and you 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 can kind of relax at that point almost and it's it's on the other person to kind of connect with you in a way yeah i mean can you talk about any of these moments with these with these probably wonderful people that kind of create this kind of chemistry and those two dichotomy of both of those experiences where you were trying to impress and then you were trying to receive that kind of impression from the other people. So I did my first round and my uh, callback before Christmas. And at the callback, I had met Lenny. And it was kind of one of those weird audition processes where you come out after the audition and you call your agent and you talk about it. And you kind of end up just saying, like, everything seemed to just happen. Everything went kind of perfectly. And I have no, I'm not in any doubt about how I came across or how I received information or how I received notes. And and I was kind of like, oh, this is almost feels too good to be true. And then there's that awful Christmas hiatus where everyone goes back to their families and normal life resumes. But in the back of your head, you're just kind of like, when am I going to hear? When am I going to hear? When am I going to hear? And then after Christmas, I, uh, I got a call from Lara, my agent, from uh, Louise Kiley, the casting director. She said that, okay, so I have kind of amazing news and I have kind of awkward news. The amazing news was that you've got down to chemistry read. And I was like, oh my God, thank Lord, our savior. I was so happy. <laughs> and and then, um, then Lara said, and the awkward news is that they're not calling any boys back other than you for Connell. So read into that what you will but it's not an offer so that's like i think that's an interesting place to jump off in terms mm. of like i was like okay so it's, it's kind of mine yeah or they're trusting me at this point that they are quietly confident that it's me but they're not confident enough to offer you the part and i was kind of like okay okay and then you, sh- you suddenly start catastrophizing and you're, you're like okay so the part is essentially in my hands what do I do? What do I have to do to lose it from this point? And you start like you start thinking of, like all the things yeah. that you could do in, a, in an audition room, which would have to be quite severe if you look at it from a realistic standpoint to lose it at that point. And then I kind of quickly checked back in and going like, okay, I'm I have no control over how they decide to present the audition process. This is a positive thing. 
I feel like I have a degree of control here. They like what I've done so far. So prepare for this in the same way you would. But also just know that it's your first time in a chemistry read setting. So be ready for... Be, I don't know, be ready to just be immersed into a different part of the process that I'd never experienced. And so the first chemistry reads was with five amazingly talented. And that was a learning experience in and in mm. itself. Because it's the it was the first time that I was kind of in and out of a room and watching an absurd level of talent coming in and out mm. and seeing just like how good everyone is and and and, and it kind of and I found that experience really liberating because I was like oh you hear cast and directors and directors say it all the time you're like at that point it's not about talent and it totally isn't oh. it's it has nothing to do with it yeah. which is both liberating and also devastating heartbreaking yes because ultimately then I feel responsible to a certain extent <laughs> that they're not getting it because the chemistry is right. either re- super compatible but not the same as it was with me and Daisy or like this person's an insanely talented actor but the way that we would work together just w- wouldn't not that it wouldn't work it just wouldn't come easy there would be mm. would be more of a risk and then but I don't think my approach necessarily changed hugely between the first chemistry read and the second chemistry read simply due to the fact that it was still new territory for me yes it was much easier the second time around that I didn't feel the need to impress as much because the offer had come in but you also probably still felt that same heartbreak with each one of these people when you knew it wasn't quite connecting or did you just retroactively think about that once daisy came yeah Uh, very much the case because i was like i was like wow these people are extraordinarily talented and i was like it was very hard for me to remain um, objective at that point because you're still, when you're in that setting, I'm acting, I'm not watching. Like, I'm with the actor, so I don't have the overall picture. I don't see how our bodies or our accents or our voices or our kind of sensibilities fit. That's not my job. That's the job of Lenny and the casting director and the producers. Um, But absolutely, in retrospect, when I met Daisy, I was like, okay, this nothing else would make sense other than this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you you actually said something like, it felt like Connell and Marianne were talking to each other, not Paul and Daisy. And, and yeah, like, yeah. What were you going to say? No, I suppose, like, <laughs> I don't know if uh, that sounds like the wanky version of what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I was. <laughs> I, the reason why I wrote that down is because that's what I was thinking while I was my cynical self watching this. I'm like, I don't know how many things I see where I feel like I don't, I'm not seeing actors, Mm. you know? So of course that was a different experience than you had. But what I'm saying is I I had the experience of like the, this feels like it's not written. Yeah. It feels like these people are coming up with this stuff, right? These are people living and we're, we're watching them like that normally doesn't happen. Maybe it happens with people that aren't as cynical as I am. You know, they might enjoy all things and think people are talking. I don't. I see actors, you know, and, and this this didn't feel like that, man. I'm not just saying that. So so but but for you to think that early on, whatever the non wanker version, what would you say? Not wanker? Wanky. Wanky. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wanky. It's like it sounds like I definitely said that with like. I don't know that just sounds very refined to me and I'm kind of cringing on myself that I said that but it did like I suppose that's the how I would best describe a situation because ultimately it's it's far simpler than that it comes down to two people who have very similar ideas about how these characters function in each other's lives and that then manifests itself in the fact that it didn't I suppose what I to 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 kind of double back on to your point is that it didn't, I didn't feel like I was doing a huge amount of acting, like in inverted commas with Daisy. Yes, yes, yes. It was like the conversation that we would be having now, I could easily kind of like segue into a scene with Daisy. No, I yeah. didn't feel like there was a massive tonal shift in it. Yeah, I, so that, I think that quote came directly out of when I met Daisy in the chemistry read. Because those, like, like as you're aware, like those um, audition settings, are basically set up for you to show your acting, show your yes. preparation. And that's, I think, that's a pit 
pitfall that I've definitely fallen into before. Yes. Probably one that I'd be more wary of now because it's a, t- it's a n- totally natural human instinct to, if you've prepared really well and you've worked really hard, you yes. want your 10 minutes of glory to show that to the people who are, and ultimately that's probably, um, that's really detrimental. It's counterproductive. Like, it, and it's yeah. not even the fault of the actors. It's, it's no, the it's way the whole thing is set instinct. up. It's so, so oh, stupid. Like auditions are brutal, like brutal events. And I think Lenny is a master of it in terms of like, I remember walking to the callback being like, holy shit, I'm going to be sitting in front of an Oscar nominated director in 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, well, I have nine cups of coffee, which was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat in and I was like, okay. And with it, I, and I'm not even saying this within about two or three minutes, he just had this amazing capacity to disarm you, to make you feel comfortable. And I don't like, I could be, this could be reductive, but I, I don't know if either Lenny is the mastermind of that or, and I can testify to this, it's down to him as a human being. Mm-hmm. He's A, an, an amazing and an, an astonishing director, but B, what allows him to be that as well is his genuine kindness and interest in the work and interest in the actor but not in a way that he like sits back and goes okay show me what you've done mm. show me what you've prepared he i remember in the callback it was very clear I, I think to be honest what went like what what i felt was the most successful part of that audition was the conversations between takes because i got an impression that he was watching how i discussed the character how we me and Lenny talked about it together because that's ultimately going to be hugely important. It doesn't matter if I come in and nail one scene from Connell in that audition setting because that can, like a lot of actors can, 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 can do that. It's about yeah. kind of him knowing, okay, but even if this isn't the way that I want the scene to be played, is he going to be able to listen to me and we us have a conversation mm-hmm. in a kind of articulate, concise way that's not going to take an hour that yeah. we can communicate efficiently. And do we fundamentally like each other? Cause we're going to be spending a lot of time together. And they're the things that I think are equally as important as the acting itself. And, and that's something that I think I've learned through the normal people audition process. It's about doing the work, working really fucking hard. And then on your walk to the audition, trying to just like, throw the work away because even if 50 percent of it percolates through because nerves are gonna like slash a huge amount of that away but it's but then going like okay i'm ready to sit into the room as a human being and meet another human being and do the job that i love doing and they're going to do the job that they love doing mm-hmm. and i think that maybe simplifies it off i'm not good at it yet but it's a practice that i'd like to um apply to my audition process a little bit more you were kind of nervous the way you described it because you've never been on a set before. So here you are with all this energy going into that first week. And you would talk, you talk about how it's, it was at um, Marianne's house that first week. And there's a lot of scenes between you and Daisy in that first week. Tell me if this is true. There is something that is what people are responding to between the two of you, the way you're acting with each other. And I was thinking maybe part of that is, because you're both in kind of a new situation that's big, like you're doing this big book and there's a lot of uh, nervousness around this and, and you're new to this whole medium. And you had to kind of focus on each other to kind of help each other to be, be safe in this. And that energy is part of what we're seeing. <laughs> Do you believe in stuff like that? Where, where like there's an, an, an actual separate energy going on between actors that helps the actual energy that is needed in the scene. Absolutely. What, what, whether I can discuss anything about it, absolutely not, because I have no <laughs> idea what that is. But I, right. I, I definitely agree with you. I think like, it's, it's so interesting. What, like, we sh- the first scene that we shot was Connell knocking on the door, being answered by Marianne and going into the kitchen. And mm-hmm. so like that, 
the, the energy of the scene mirrors the energy that I was probably feeling that day. Right. In terms of like that kind of nervous, the fear, the, just like, like all of those things that were present in the scene were definitely present within my own body. It was smart That's to make something. that the first scene. It was totally, really smart. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. But I, what, I think is equally important to discuss about that is that that's not sustainable Mm. in terms of a five month shoot. You can't, you can't try and mirror. This is to do with my own personal taste and acting. It's like, you can't physically mirror or create the atmosphere on set that mirrors the scene. That's just happened to be, I'm really useful for the first day and useful in certain instances, but not, it, it, it just depends. It depends on your style. It depends on whether you're interested in working in the method or if you're interested in kind of the craft of character and the, and the, the actual manufacturing of that. And that's, I, I'm interested in that side of things. And I think that it's important to go for me to be able to step away from it, analyze it, see what's working, see what's not, rather than to be completely introverted and kind of mm. tangled with the character for a prolonged period of time. Because yes. I think there's evidence that maybe supports that, that can be potentially damaging if not harnessed correctly and uh yeah and it's and it's not just uh yeah not just dangerous i I would say like you were getting onto it like that is not sustainable it's not um it's not malleable as a as a it's too fixed it's a fixed point i imagine it's it could be really hard to direct somebody who's working like that yes Um, yes and and that's not to say that i have seen countless performances where the work itself has been extraordinary, but whether, and th- this is purely hy- hy- like I'm hy- hypothesizing here is I don't know if I would enjoy working with somebody to the same extent that I enjoyed working with Daisy or actors like Daisy in that setting where it's collaborative. You're like bouncing around with ideas as Paul and Daisy about discussing the characters, these external things that are sitting in front of you that you I've prepared enough that you can then step into and step out of. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious about that because I haven't come across, I haven't worked with people who work in that way. And I, I'm, I, I'm incredibly curious about that kind of stuff. Let's talk about one scene in particular that, and I think it kind of touches on what you're talking about here because the, the therapy scene, the, the, the really important moment during that, which is kind of broken up through that episode. I, I, I heard you say something like, you felt like it was your duty to, as, as, as a person to, to portray that moment, uh, uh, realistically and, uh, authentically, you know, but that intention of, of wanting to do your duty as a person to, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm imagining that that doesn't necessarily help you as an actor. You know what I mean? Like, no, that. Totally. <laughs> yeah. No, not uh, so all. it wasn't and I discovered that very quickly. <laughs> we'll talk about that because because that that scene is there's something really special that happens in there and people are talking about it and people feel a real connection there. So you did your duty, but how did you how did you get there as an actor? So the day that I reread the book for I, I think it was the second or third time that I reread it, but the first time that re I reread it knowing that I was going to be playing Connell, that was the scene that stuck out for me. Because I knew, like, I was like, oh, shit, this is a real thing now. I'm going to be playing a version of that scene, which has moved me as a reader countless times. And I feel like in a visual setting, there's an onus on me in the TV show to do the same for the viewers. And a silly pressure to put on myself, but it's pressure that it just exists. I couldn't, I couldn't get away from that. I, could, I couldn't try and, like, ignore the fact that this is a scene that, like, is going to be really hard, but it's it's one that's structured really well. And then I remember we did a read through at the start of the second block. Um, so at that point, I've, I've probably been playing Connell for about what uh, two months, two and a half months, so t- ten weeks, let's say. And we did a read through, and uh, with Hetty, who directed the second block, who's amazing. I remember we were reading episode ten, and I was like, what? Because I wouldn't be like a, like a crier or anything like that. Because like the back of my throat was kind of going like, <laughs> I was getting like, as we were moving through the episode. I remember we got to that scene and I couldn't read the thing. I was like, oh, cop onto yourself, Paul. It's a read through. I remember people coming up to me after being like, oh God, that was so like, and that was the worst thing that happened. 
because I was like, oh shit, how do I, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know, because I, I had no, like, there was no process in that. I was just feeling sorry for the character. I was like reading it with like, I was just like, oh Christ almighty. <laughs> but at the point then when we got to the shoot, I remember having discussions with Hetty about like how she wanted to operate the set that day and I was, t- I was totally malleable, malleable in that sense because I hadn't been a, on a set prior where those scenes were present. Yeah. So I was like, I trust you. You decided, I, I don't want to be involved in that process. I kind of want to just arrive and feel what, like, like to kind of figure it out as, I, as I'm going because I think it would be remiss of me to kind of state something that I have, have no evidence wor- evidence of myself. I, I don't know if it works or not. So I was like, trust your instinct in terms of how you want to set up. So I remember coming to set that day with Noma who played the, the counselor who's incredible. And the set was quite like quiet and at that point like you know the crew like you're spending more time with them than you are anybody else and they're like you're having the crack and you're like joking and but with that that wasn't present that day and then Hattie was like do you want to start uh with tight uh with tight coverage or do you want to start out wide and build in and again I had no idea I was like uh eeny meeny miny mo let's start wide <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big mistake <laughs> so like I broke down in the first two takes and I was like oh was that a mistake but I'm also not like I don't believe in kind of like saving your performance for the tight coverage because you're not doing your editor you're not doing anybody any favors by doing that but then as a then suddenly I felt the pressure of the camera I felt the kind of ominous pressing mm. of like the various setups kind of moving in I was like oh fuck, nothing's happening, nothing, I just feel like I'm coasting on top of the lines, you know that feeling when you're like, mm-hmm. it was, the whole thing was, as I said, it was like I, this duty which wasn't useful, this duty to the character who I loved and who I do love, and who I was like, let's, because I'm, I was aware that that scene is crucial in terms of kind of, it's a, it's a catalyst for a lot of his decisions moving into episode 11 and 12. And if that doesn't feel authentic and doesn't feel real, you're kind of, the character's floating on nothing. So the camera pushed in kind of closer to lunch. Nothing was really happening. Hetty was amazing. She was like, let's just go for your cigarette, come back in. Nothing was happening. And then they went for lunch. And I was like, right, no, I don't, I like, I need to just, I didn't go down to lunch. I just went up and listened to some music, listened to like my playlist for the character. I remember just, I remember saying, I remember having like a kind of, weird conversation where I actually was like talking to myself <laughs> and I was like oh I just had to leave I was like you're not doing yourself any favors like try and just remove your ego or remove your desire to achieve the character mm-hmm. at the door go back in and approach it as you I'd approach the rest of the shoot I remember just going like right just do it just do it just do the thing and, and that's not that's not necessarily in terms of manifesting emotion. It was just like very simply act, think the thoughts, and try and manifest be, them. Be. Yeah, <laughs> just be, just be. Yeah. And there was a. I remember sitting down in the chair, and I don't know if I haven't even discussed this with Hetty or Kate, who was the DP. I felt the camera come into like it felt like oh, the camera was in place for like the the, the tight shot, the the master like tight shot. And it just like, I, I remember I, I read back over the scene at lunch and I was kind of thinking, okay, what are the lines that when I first read them kind of punched me in the gut? The lines that stick out to me is like, was when he says, um, back home people like me here. I don't think people like me that much. When he, did, when he talks about missing Marianne and how smart she is, when he discusses him wanting to have a new life here and coming here with all the hope and kind of excitement that that brings but feeling ultimately incredibly let down by the reality of the situation i think that's incredibly upsetting really and then that's all exacerbated by the fact that the person who could save him and make him feel better is gone and he feels guilty of that but ultimately one of his friends has committed suicide so no he the, 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 his past life is no longer 
the same. He can't mm-hmm. retreat back to that and kind of fall back into it and everything's going to be the same because it's not. His life has irreversibly changed and the life that he's now been dealt is not one that makes him happy. And I remember thinking that as that take happened, I was like, oh, it made acting feel so much, it's not easy, but simpler. Does that make sense? It just felt like, yes. oh, I was doing too much or I was concentrating on the wrong thing. And then, of course, then the rest of the day was kind of relatively consistent in that sense. And I feel like I, I don't necessarily like talking about it in that sense because it's like, it's not that I don't like talking about it because I think it's like, I like hearing other actors talk about it, but I, I'd be loath to kind of say, this is the process, this is the thing that works because I don't, I don't know yet. I haven't done it a second. Like I haven't done <laughs> yeah. another scene like that. So who fucking knows what the next one will be like? Yes. I know for a fact I will ask for the tight coverage first though. <laughs> Having the book to keep going back to, both in preparation and and as you were filming, you know, must have been so helpful to both of you. Does that make you want to kind of replicate that kind of thing for yourself for any other projects? And by that, I mean, like, a lot of actors I've talked to say they write, they literally write the history (laughs) of their character in their own words, Mm -hmm. like almost like a diary that they can kind of go back to something like that to, to in a story way in a, in a, you know, does anything like that um, um, make sense to you or is it, or I think it depends totally. Like I was absolutely spoiled with normal people. That's the source material. No, in, in, it depends on whether the source material is strictly a script or, if you're doing a Chekhov play, would, you, would I do Stanislavski lists? Probably. Have I done Stanislavski, Stanislavski lists for all of my characters? No. But I kind of, there's like, I like doing this thing, which it was an exercise that we did in drama school that I use quite like, would use. It's like this thing called character mull over where like, it's kind of like a game where you would, you do quite a bit of prep. You'd read the script. You kind of develop your little hunches and your, your ideas about the character and then like when you're going to the shop you try and imagine how your character like even if the character's in moscow in the 18th century how would they go to like how do they interact with people mm. and it's like whenever you're at a kind of loose end that you kind of constantly feel like you're preparing if you're like make like doing tasks or figuring these things out and like there's also the other side of things where like you hear like like i, I was talking to josh o'connor the actor recently he was talking about his preparation of doing a film like God's Own Country when he was like he has to work on a farm so they went up and worked on a farm and like did the labor so that when you're on screen it feels you're not thinking about and it's not to do like oh I'm doing the real thing as a flashy thing it's the total opposite it's like Mm. you've plenty of other things to be worrying about when you're filming you don't want to be worrying about like oh if I pick this bucket up does that feel authentic that's just something that you can do for free and that's the kind of thing that brings me back to the point of like that's something you can control. That's one of the controllables is your preparation. If you're playing a character who is a farmer and you have the opportunity to go farming, go do it. But that's not necessarily afforded all the time. Sometimes you have to be more like um, dexterous in terms of your choices about how you prepare. But I think that that's kind of a constantly moving thing for me. If I had an entire book of the character I was going to play. And then I, not only is it uh, in one way amazing, but you know that there are thousands, if not millions of people that have an idea of what that, what that character is. Every page uh, in this book that is a resource for me, somebody has a different idea of this and they're going to see this. And I don't know how that wouldn't be crippling. It felt crippling after we shot it. I was like, oh, shit, the thing that I've done is now I have no control over. It's done. I've made my decisions. And if people don't like it, I can't change it. Not that I would, but you know what I mean? Like, yes. um, I always saw the book as a really positive source, obviously, because it's like incredibly 
detailed in terms of its discussion of the characters and it gives you real insight and and especially playing a character that like as Sally said when she first started adapting the scripts Connell was a really difficult character to write because he doesn't say a lot so how do you make that a thing so it was like in terms of preparation it was like trying to figure out the like the grunts and the noises that he makes in response to things in the absence of an actual line. And those are things that like there's kind of descriptions of in the book and something that I could like rely on and sit on in scenes when I feel like Connell wants to say something, but doesn't, how does that manifest? And it normally Mm. kind of manifests in little like mannerisms or like grunts or exhales and, and things like that. And those those th- those mannerisms are directly manifested from the source material. It feels like people are reacting to this in the way I reacted to it. I feel like, wow, I'm in I'm in conjunction with the public. Like this is amazing. <laughs> like <I'm, laughs> I feel like they're seeing what I'm seeing finally, and that's amazing. But now I'm, you know, you've kind of become a star, and they are talking about your chain. They're talking about your shorts. I, I, there's articles about yes. things like this now, Paul. And all you're doing is sitting at home. Like, this has got to be weird because, like, you're in lockdown. <laughs> you're, you've been sent out all over the world, this work, and people are building you up in this way. And, like, if, if, if there was an article about Daisy's shorts, you know, it would be, it would be a real problem. Like, so I, I wanted to know, and I don't know if people talk like this, uh, to men, because I think they think men like this or something. So I just wanted to know that this kind of, this part of this whole equation, which is, like I said, I preface this by saying, you're getting recognized for this work. But then there's this yeah. other side, which is, are you are you just feeling light about this about, and fun about this? Or is this like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, probably light. the light and fun side of it has definitely come and gone. Because he, my attention is drawn to it in the sense of like, oh, I don't want these things that are items of costume to be talked about more than the production. And I don't think it is it, like in, in, in the broader sense of the word. But um, yeah, it, it's a tricky thing to balance uh, or even kind of wrap my head around and something that I haven't probably done yet. Um, yeah, it's... What do I actually think about it? I think it's slightly potentially problematic. It's not something I'm desperately comfortable with, but I think for the most part, it's people aren't saying it with any kind of malice or malintent. They're saying it as, like, I think those pieces of costume are slightly totemic in terms of their idea of the character. It's directly associated with the character. It's not this thing that's isolated or like is born out of nothing. And I'm trying to see it in a positive light but it is it's a difficult thing to process because it's brand new it's like it's it's something that's only existed in my life in the last six seven weeks or however long the show's been out right right do you have something that is going to be happening when lockdown ends i mean are you on the verge of like getting into another project yeah hopefully um there's a, a film on the cards but it's uh as i'm sure you're well aware it's difficult to no, if that it looks like it's positively going to happen but uh difficult to tell at the moment but if it does i'd be really really excited to do paul mescal i am genuinely excited about your career and what you have to give us in the future man i really really mean that thank you so much that means an awful lot it's really nice to get to talk about acting in the broader sense of the word but thank you very much One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.